Well, uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, for those of you who are perhaps new or visiting, uh, if I haven't met you, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm the student pastor here at Toon Gabby Baptist Church, and I have the privilege of opening up God's Word this morning. <clears throat> How can we, as a church community, make sure that we don't just survive, but thrive together? How can we, as a church community, Make sure we don't just survive, but thrive together. You know, there are heaps of good things about doing life in community. But whether you're a new or a long-standing member of our church, you know that doing life together isn't an easy thing. Very quickly, we actually discover that people are often takers and not givers. For example... Uh, if you live with your family, how often do you open up the fridge at 12 o'clock at night and you realize someone else has drunk the last bit of milk and they left the empty container in the fridge for someone else to clean up? Or can you think of that friend or housemate who just vomit vents all their issues onto you without ever considering how you're going? If you're an employer... You've probably experienced an employee cancelling a shift an hour or less before it starts. And now you have to stay back late or rush to find a replacement. The dishes left in all sorts of weird and exotic places for someone else to find. The person who's way too loud at night. The friend who's just way too happy and loud in the morning. The person who cuts you off in traffic. The unreliable teammate on your serving or sports team. And perhaps the worst of all, that person who snags your parking spot, even though they clearly see you going for it. The list could just go on and on and on, couldn't it? The reality is, there are plenty of things that make doing life together difficult. We often have a posture of being takers and not givers. And unfortunately, our tendency to so quickly take and so reluctantly give leads to much angst and tension between us at times. Uh, and perhaps you're sitting here today and you can feel some of that tension already. Well, our text is Philippians 2 verses 1 to 18. And I am convinced that God does not intend for us to merely put up with one another, but to joyfully thrive together. And the question for us to consider today is, how does Jesus help us with this? How does, how does Jesus take us from being takers and turn us into givers? A big question that we need to consider is how does Jesus transform an entire community into servants? Well, to answer these pressing questions, we are going to explore three things in our passage. The first is the servant mindset of Jesus. Then work out your salvation. And finally, rejoice. The servant mindset of Jesus, work out your salvation and rejoice. And it's worth saying, uh, I think up front, that we cannot we cannot explore all that is contained in these 18 verses. Uh, otherwise, it's probably going to feel like we're trying to drink water out of a fire hydrant. It's just, it's too much. And so I want us to narrow our attention on the central message that God is communicating to us today. And that is to challenge us. To challenge us to dare to believe it is more blessed to give than to receive. Dare to believe it is more blessed to give than to receive. So let's jump in. The servant mindset of Jesus. Well, Paul, uh, he's the author here. He starts off by telling us that we've been joined to Jesus and brought into community. And so verses 1 and 2 sort of cover things like being united, being of one mind and one spirit connected together. And really what Paul is saying is, if we want to thrive in our church communities, the first step is to become convinced that we are better together. To borrow a phrase from Rich Australia, we are better together. 
But then Paul goes on and he says something quite radical in verses 3 and 4. If you have your Bible, open them up with me. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. See, God's vision for our church community is far more than harmonious living. Uh, it's joyful, thriving together. And the key to it is humility. And it's often said that true humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but thinking about yourself less because your focus is on others. You know, Paul knows that what we give our attention to, the things that we think about and focus on, ultimately shape the trajectory of our lives and it forms the reputation of our community. And this idea of considering others as first priority, if you will, directly connects to verse 5. And this is a key verse in our passage this morning. It says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. We are told to adopt the same mindset as Jesus. Well, a mindset, it's, it's a way of thinking. It's linked with our attitudes and our motivations for things. And the key to a thriving community is to adopt the same mindset as Jesus. And this mindset we see on marvelous display in verses 6 to 8. Because here we see what it looks like in action to live for the benefit of others. Talking about Jesus, it reads, Who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, Jesus gave up his right to be served and became a servant. Now, I love this line from uh, Ray Galea in his book, Eager to Serve. Actually, talking about this passage, he says, When you take something that isn't yours, it's called stealing. And when you take something that is yours, it's called exercising your rights. But what do you call it when you refuse to take hold of what is yours by right? Well, it's both extremely rare and amazing. And that is what Jesus did. Jesus gave up his right to be served and he became a servant. Just think about that for a moment and allow that truth to sink in. How fitting are these words found in Matthew 20, 28. The son of man, as Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the mindset of Christ is a humble servant mindset. At its core, it's a commitment to the good of others. And then verses 9 to 11, we see that Jesus, he is both a servant and he is king. Because at the resurrection of Jesus, he was lifted to the highest place, verse 9. He was given the name that is above all names, verse 10. Jesus is king, verse 11. Now, I know that verses 1 to 11, we have only skimmed the very surface of this morning. But we've explored these verses because they form the crucial backdrop to verse 12. And in verse 12, we receive a very important and wonderful instruction from Paul. So let's keep reading. He says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. 
This is our second point. Work out your salvation. We are to work out our salvation. Uh, not, not work for salvation, but work it out. Really, this working out process is a ripple effect of salvation. It kind of answers the question, well, now that I'm saved by Jesus, what happens next? Well, what's next is to work out your salvation. And I think, I think that sometimes we can read this verse and think to ourselves, it means I should uh, read my Bible a bit more often and I should pray a little more. I should, I should probably come to church more regularly, tithe a bit more money, be a bit more kind to my brother or sister, uh, obey my parents. And, and yes, those are all very good things and they matter. However, let's not forget the context in which we just discovered this verse. See, to work out your salvation in context means to exercise having the same servant mindset as Jesus. It means taking up a commitment to living for the good of others. It means practicing being a giver and not a taker. You see, this instruction from Paul is not a general command to godliness. It's a specific command to practicing humility. Really? It means that we dare to believe it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, coming up on the screen in a second is, I'm, I'm going to put up a photo, uh, and it's controversial. Let me warn you, it's controversial. This might even split the church, and it might be my last day here. It's coming up on the screen now, all right? What color is that dress? Who knows, who knows what picture that is? Yes, yes, right? Some of you are like, oh, I know this. I've seen this before. This is an old one. See, this picture, it went viral in 2015 um, because some people look at that dress and they say it's blue and it's black. Some people clearly see that. Other people look at that dress and they see sort of white and gold. And it's, it's a little bit weird if you see that. I'm going to be honest. I'm not judging you too hard if you say it's white and gold. See, this picture, it, uh, yeah, it got posted to social media in 2015 and uh, there was basically a heated debate uh, over, like, from everyone as to what colour this dress is. Who actually sees this thing the right way? Blue and black or white and gold? Now, the reason that we see things so differently here, um, I'm, I'm not going to get you to say who sees what because you can all debate that afterwards as to who sees what colours. But it has something to do with the way that our eyes perceive light and the makeup of our eyes and stuff like that. And, you know, someone who's way more smart than me and better at explaining can do that via Google afterwards if you're interested. And, uh, yes, I am keen to continue that debate after the service. But here's the point. Here's the point. What, to, to work out our salvation means that we adopt the same mindset as Jesus a servant mindset. And this matters because it is calling us to actually see things differently. To see and treat people differently in light of God's grace. It is the call to see ourselves and the importance of others in light of grace. See, you and I, we live in an age of entitlement, don't we? where we are told to do whatever we want to do, with whoever we want to do it, whenever we want to do it. We are told to do whatever makes us happy. And can I say, if that's the way that you think, that actually makes perfect sense. I get it. That way of thinking actually makes perfect sense if life is all about me. But today we run into a pretty staggering truth that grace flips the script. You see, it is possible for us to serve without a deep understanding of God's grace. But it is impossible for us to have a deep understanding of God's amazing grace and to not serve. 
when we experience the grace of God in Jesus, seeing how he laid down his life for our benefit, we will serve others. When we grasp the depth of God's love for us, as displayed on the cross, where Jesus, our Savior, was beaten and mocked and tortured and abused and crushed, and knowing that it was my sin that held him there, knowing that it was for my benefit that the king of the universe died. When I see the grace of God on the cross, then I see the gospel. Then I see the gospel. When I see the lowliness and the humility of our great God as never before, then I see the gospel. And friends, I need to say that today, the only thing that can bring about the deep restoration and transformation that we need in our lives, it is the grace of God. You see, no amount of guilt tripping ourselves into serving or try harder sort of attitude will ever bring about the change that we need. Grace changes us from being takers and turns us into givers. People who give out of the overflow, out of the abundance that we have in Christ Jesus. So the key to a transformed community of Jesus-centered people who joyfully thrive together is grace. It is grace. And it is when we get this great motivation of God's grace that the rest of our passage, it sort of begins to fit together. It starts to make a bit more sense. In verse 14, it says, do everything out of grumble, uh, sorry, do everything without grumbling or arguing. I mean, this is a great place for us to start when we are working out our grace-fueled salvation. See, it doesn't matter where we are or what we're doing. We should be a community characterized by a servant mindset. And it's clearly something Paul intends us to take pretty seriously. We're to do it with fear and with trembling. We are to stand out like stars in the night sky, to use the language of verse 15. Because we are going to be like fish swimming against the current of our culture as we hold on to the word of life. But I do need to say, uh, at risk of stating the plainly obvious here, this is hard, isn't it? I mean, after all, you and I have plenty of things that we could complain about. For example, this could be anything, really, from someone being rude to you. Maybe you've got an annoying cramp. Your weight isn't low enough. The kids are being annoying. You aren't tall enough. Okay, I particularly struggle with that one there. I will, I will be honest. I'll be honest. I complain about that. But seriously, how are we going to serve when it really doesn't suit our schedule? Or the effort that you put in continually goes unnoticed. Maybe we don't like the area that you've been asked to serve in, or quite frankly, the people either. You see, I totally get that some of us are here today and you're doing it tough. The experience of serving is a hard slog and it doesn't feel very joyful. And isn't God's vision for our community to be joyfully thriving together? Well, our final point addresses this very issue. Point three, rejoice. Rejoice. See, we've seen the servant mindset of Jesus. We've seen the call to work out our salvation. And now we can rejoice. See, the final few verses in our passage show us that even in extraordinary service, in genuine sacrifice, we can rejoice. We can rejoice. Uh, and I think there are a few examples from everyday life that kind of back this idea up. Uh, a good example would be buying presents. Uh, you know, recently I was in a little situation where I needed to buy someone a present, uh, but for the life of me, I could not figure out what to buy. Uh, have you ever been in that sort of stitch up before? Uh, it was mum's birthday and she turned 21 again this year, would you believe it? Um, 
And you know, I needed to get, I needed to get her something nice, right? I needed to buy her something, and but I, I couldn't think of what to get her. And I was thinking, and I was thinking, and I was thinking, and uh, and then it hit me. Me being the best middle child that she's ever had in her life, I got it. I'm going to get her a gift card to one of her favorite places in the world, and I get ChatGBT to do up a card for her. Perfect job done. No, I, I did handwrite the card. I did handwrite it. But you see, do you know that feeling, don't you? When it finally hits you and you realize, yes, that is the perfect gift. And there's joy and there's a sense of anticipation that comes with that because you know they're going to love it. And even though the gift ends up costing way more than you planned on spending, the joy far outweighs the sacrifice, doesn't it? I think another example of this would be child sponsorships through companies like Compassion or supporting missionaries. There is a genuine cost to our giving, but because of the good that it achieves, there is far more reason to rejoice. Or take giving blood, donating blood, for example. It's inconvenient. It takes up our time. But because of the good that it achieves, there is far more reason for us to rejoice. It, uh, the, the good it achieves far outweighs the inconvenience. You see, even in genuine sacrifice, we can rejoice. Now look with me at verses 17 and 18 as we see this reality in our passage. Paul writes, Even if I am being poured out like a drink offering, on the sacrifice and the service coming from your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. And so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul says he's going to be poured out. He's willing to be poured out like a drink offering. I mean, serving is clearly costly. For Paul, uh, it, it actually meant more prison time more false accusations, more trials, more tests, more pain. And in the context of the book, the, the Philippian church had actually made the very costly decision to financially support Paul. But did you notice the reciprocal joy here in our passage? See, both Paul and the Philippians' joy, it will not waver. Because their joy is rooted in seeing the gospel advance, in actually seeing the good that it achieves. In chapter 1, verse 3, uh, earlier in the letter, Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. See, they are partners with Paul in God's amazing grace. They're on mission together. Their aim is to make and grow disciples of Jesus. And so giving for them is no longer a burden, but a blessing. And friends, today, if, if you remember nothing else, I, we need to get this. When the advancement of the gospel is more important to us than whatever it might cost us, what we will find is that the joy remains despite the cost. So let's imitate Paul. And let's imitate the believers in the Philippian church. Let's dare to believe it is more blessed to give than to receive. And for those of us here this morning, uh, you might be finding the experience of serving a hard slog unpleasant, costly, not very joyful. Can I encourage you this morning to keep going? Don't get sucked into the trap of arguing and complaining and grumbling. Please know that, that God's design of humble service is good. And know that Jesus isn't oblivious to your struggles and to your needs. He is attuned to our thoughts and to our feelings. And it, it's probably worth saying also that your salvation is not dependent on how much you serve or how good the results are. 
But keep going. Keep going. It is good for us to check our motivations at times, isn't it? The why behind our serving. Is it fueled by duty or is it fueled by gospel motivations? So we have seen the extraordinarily humble servant mindset of Jesus. And we've seen Paul's instruction to us, work out your salvation, imitate this servant mindset and do that under the motivation of God's grace. And then we finally saw that we can rejoice despite the cost. See, today we have been challenged to dare to believe it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so I think by way of us closing this morning, I want us to consider something. I want us to consider how are we contributing to making this community thrive? How are we contributing to making this community thrive? Maybe a few considerations for us could be, if you are not currently on a serving team, could you be on one? Will you today consider joining a life group? And how are we going with personally caring for one another? You know, I think we cannot walk away from these verses knowing that person X has just lost a loved one or person X has just had a baby or person X has got some chronic pain or, or person X is just doing it tough right now. And we can't sit in our life groups, our friendship circles, our serving teams and continue to think, I really hope my leader reaches out to them or my pastor goes and visits them. No, friends, we are to reach out. We are to go and find out how we can love them practically. So let's work out our salvation by presenting the grace of God in humble, radically self-sacrificial and tangible ways. Let us not be passive disciples of Jesus, but servant-minded and joyful disciples. See, how can we as a community make sure that we don't just survive, but thrive together? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Amen.